Welcome back again. Here we are with Babette Rothschild. We're talking about eight keys to safe trauma recovery. Looking at the book, uh, Babette, I noticed that the first key, and it seems like it in some ways it must be the most important key that you talk about, has to do with mindfulness. Could you say something about what you mean when you talk about mindfulness? Sure, and, I, and I'll say it's, a, it's the foundation. That's why it comes first. Um, whether it's more important than the others, I don't know, but it definitely provides a baseline. I've wanted to help people to develop what I call a mindful gauge so that they can be in the driver's seat of their recovery and be able to determine for themselves what is useful for them and what is not useful for them and even to predict ahead of time what routes of self-help or professional help they might pursue and which they might leave aside. I get so many emails and letters from people who have tried things that haven't been successful. And I thought, what, what are they missing? What are they not getting? Why are they um, getting involved in things that aren't useful to them? And it's really um, important that people have tools to be able to know themselves better so that they can make those evaluations. And mindfulness is a thousand year, many thousand years um, method for just that purpose, for knowing the self. And in this case, it's an application of mindfulness toward knowing myself and so being able to make better judgments about what will be and is good for me and what won't be and is not. So that sounds in some ways kind of philosophical but I guess you're using it in a very practical way so what's mindfulness in practice day to day for somebody who's using it the way that you talk about it in the book? The basic practice of mindfulness if you look back to to the meditation practice of it involves four branches. Um, one's basic body awareness, another is awareness of thoughts, another is awareness of emotions, and then there's also a spiritual aspect. It's the first three that I'm applying in um, Eight Keys to Safe Trauma Recovery with regard to helping people develop a mindful gauge. That's the body, the thoughts, and the emotions you're talking yes. about. Yes. Yeah. So to learn to pay attention to what's going on in my body right now. If I apply mindfulness to myself right now, I can say that um, my feet are a tiny bit cold, I'm very alert as we're talking, and I can hear the vibration of my voice in my throat. Yeah. Okay, that's very simple mm. body awareness. Yeah. Awareness of emotion, I'm uh, content, happy, excited mm. that we're having this discussion now, and my thoughts are very geared toward what we're talking about, maybe a couple of beats ahead mm. of what I say. Yeah, right. Okay? So that's, that's basic, yeah, basic, sure. basic mindfulness. So how would somebody apply that in working on their recovery from trauma? Could you give an example? I'd love to give an example. I'll give an example that's straight from the book. Um, a client of mine uh, came to me because she was having trouble receiving physical affection from her friends. Anytime somebody gave her a hug, she would do what we call dissociate, meaning she'd space out, um, she wasn't in contact, she couldn't feel the touch, so she could get a hug, but she couldn't feel that she got the hug and, and take the benefit of it, so to speak. This was very distressing to her. It interfered with some of her relationships, and she felt really sort of stupid that she would say that, that she couldn't have affection like everybody else. So my thought for her was that it's perhaps that she just wasn't honing in on the right thing for her mm. and in the right proportions. And I thought that if she learned mindfulness, she might have a basis for evaluating what she was going to ask for with regard to affection. So that's what we did. I, we spent some time in the, in the sessions talking about mindfulness and helping her pay attention to what was happening in her body, her emotions, and her thoughts. And then I gave her little assignments to do between sessions 
to use mindfulness to pay attention to what was happening in her body or her thinking as she made choices in a normal day. What she was going to wear in the morning, what she was going to have for lunch, what she was going to watch on television in the evening, who she was going to call for a chat. Um, and pay attention, take a little time before she followed through on a choice to see how it affected her. So for example, um, if she was going to wear a red dress or a blue sweater on a morning and make that decision, see what it felt like in her body, which felt warmer, which felt cozier, she imagined wearing the one or the other, um, which she felt more happy wearing or whatever. Um, whatever thoughts she had about them. And then make her choice and see if what she had uh, become aware of when she was debating about it actually was how it, it felt as she followed through. So she could learn to trust her feeling of what felt good or not good or at least to see if it was exactly. working out for her or not. Exactly, exactly. So how did that work out in Well, once in she got good issue? at it, um, she came and she had a couple of, of um, signals, what we would call a mindful gauge, that she came to rely on a lot. And that one was very body-based, and that was when she was looking at choices that weren't particularly good for her, her heart rate would go up, and ones that were good for her, her heart rate would go down. And another that was very useful for her was she would get an image in her mind's eye of a little rabbit, a little bunny rabbit, and when she was moving toward a choice that wasn't going to be so good for her, the rabbit would look more and more distressed, and when she was moving toward choices that were more appealing to her, the rabbit would look more and more calm. Okay, So we decided she was ready to apply this with affection, and she invited a friend, a good trusted friend, to come to the session with her, and as soon as we sat down, she asked her friend for a hug, her friend gave her a hug, and she totally dissociated. Um, she was she she couldn't hear me. Uh, her eyes were glazed. Her face was pale. I asked her friend to let go and sit at a distance from her. Gradually, my client revived, and um, we talked about it. My client was embarrassed. I said, "You know what? That was a great experiment. You know, you showed yourself exactly what happened, um, and." what might you do differently next time? And she said, well, you know, what I forgot to do was apply mindfulness. All this practice we've been doing on mindfulness, I forgot to do it. I just thought I wanted a hug, and I asked for the hug, and obviously it was too much. So I suggested to her that instead, this time, we take another step, and she imagine two or three different kinds of touch she might be able to ask her friend for, and before she asks to imagine them, and see what happens in her heart rate and see what happens with the image of the rabbit. She did this for some minutes and found that if she imagined her friend touching her shoulder that her heart rate was slow and the rabbit looked very calm. And so she thought that might be possible. So she did indeed ask her friend to come over, put her hand on her shoulder, and when the friend did that, my client sighed, got a little cheery, and did not dissociate. And she said that she felt calm and both happy that she could accept the hand on the shoulder and sad that it wasn't a hug. Mm. So it was like a, you know, a, a negotiation, a, mm. a compromise mm. in between. But it was the most touch she'd been able to have mm. in her memory that she didn't dissociate. Mm. And for her that was a huge step. So finding her own way to a touch that was not too much for her, mm. that she could accept and manage. I couldn't have told her. I had no idea what would be possible for her. She had to use her own mindful gauge to imagine herself and then apply that. And the reason I have that chapter at the beginning mm. of the book is for that reason. Mm. There is no way I can tell any of my readers what's going to be good for them. Mm. There is nobody who can tell you or anybody else what's good for you. I'm, I'm thinking of the line we used to say to each other when we were kids, you're not the boss of me. 
You mm. remember saying that to your friends? I'm not the boss of anybody, and there's no way I can be, but I can help my reader be the boss of themselves mm. and find out, have some tools to be able to find out what's going to be useful for them and what isn't. And every step of the way in my book, and I'm suggesting for any other book they use or for any other therapy they engage in, that they establish and then use a mindful gauge every step of the way to find out what will be helpful to them and what won't be helpful to them. And for everybody, what they use for mindful gauge will be different. Some people are going to use a more body-based gauge. Some people are going to use a more emotionally-based gauge. Some are going to have thought processes or images, mm. like my client did, the bunny yeah, rabbit, that yeah. would look more distressed and look more calm. It, again, I can't tell anybody what's going to be the best gauge for them, but I can present the idea and then they have to make the experiments to find out for themselves. Right. So this is to do what you talked at the beginning about people being out of control in trauma. This is about helping people to take back control. In fact, as if I recall, this, the uh, subtitle for your book is Take Charge Strategies to Empower Your Healing. So this is one of the keys to taking charge. Exactly. To be able, and it's a foundational key, to be able to have that knowledge of yourself that you are able to decide every step of the way what is best for you, rather than having somebody else tell you what's best for you. Oh, great. Well, thanks very much for that, Babette. I'm You're sure welcome. we'll be coming back later to talk about some of the other keys in the book. Thanks great. very much. Thank you, Michael.